start sharing some slides here. Great. Again, thank you all for being here. I'm really excited to have you all. So some points throughout the presentation. Um, I do encourage you keeping your mute on and your video off throughout the duration of this presentation. Not only does it help um, with the bandwidth for the presentation slides, but it also just prevents some distractions. And if you view your presentation in full screen mode, you'll get the, the full effects. Um, see all the photos, you won't be missing out on, any, on anything. And if you have any questions, please use the chat. You can throw in anything throughout the entire presentation into the chat, and then we'll address that at the very end in the last 10 to 15 minutes of the presentation. So um, feel free to use that. And most importantly, we just hope you have a good time that you're learning something new. Um, be curious, get excited, and let us know if you have any questions. So Alaska Wildlife Alliance, we've been around since the 70s. And this presentation tonight is free because of our members, like I mentioned earlier. So thank you so much for those who are here who are members. We really appreciate what you do for Alaska's wildlife and allowing the, these presentations be possible. And this presentation is part of our Kenai Peninsula chapter, which is an informal chapter, but it is uh, focused towards Kenai Peninsula specific topics. And these presentations are every third Wednesday of the month. So the three pillars of AWA, we focus a lot on citizen science, education, and advocacy. And some citizen science we have coming up in the spring, uh, we will be monitoring the critically endangered cook inlet beluga whales. And as part of the Alaska Beluga Monitoring Partnership, uh, AWA co-hosts the Kenai and Kasilof monitoring sites. So if that's something you're interested in doing this spring, we would appreciate your time and you can visit the AKBMP website, which I can throw into the chat in a moment. And we also uh, work a lot on education. We do some tabling events and wildlife walks in the summer. You may have seen us at some festivals like the Bear Paw Festival or Salmon Fest. Um, the Chugach 5051 Fest last summer as well. So looking at this summer, you could see us around. And the top photo is from our Southeast chapter volunteer, Lori Craig, bless her soul. <laughs> she does so much for AWA, but she is holding a sign that is now featured on the electric bus system in Juneau. So maybe you've seen that. And we also work on advocacy. We currently have a lawsuit. We have several out, but uh, the most recent one we have was to protect and prevent harassment towards the Beaufort Sea polar bear population in Northern Alaska. So just a sampling of some things we're up to. If you wanna see more, you can check out our news page on the website. Our annual report of all the work we've done in 2021 is now up, um, as well as our map the trap report on mapping traps on trails in Alaska, that's up. And the report from last year is also live. We were featured in the news challenging the Ambler Road, and we also were successful in reducing trawling by catch in the Bering Sea by up to 35%. And lots of Alaskan groups came together on that, and that was passed in December. Some upcoming events. Uh, we always have Wildlife Wednesdays through April, and the Kenai chapter, as I mentioned, is the third Wednesday of every month. And we also have a climate adaptation workshop coming up in February. And that is a free workshop, it's for the public. And it is discussing more of the RAD framework, which is resist, accept, direct framework that um, our vice president on our board actually uh, publishes a lot of work on. And that's something the National Park Service and uh, USGS adopts. Uh, so if you're interested in how uh, we can resist, accept, and direct climate change effects in the state of Alaska, you're invited to go to that workshop and you can register online on our website. Um, some past and current events, we do Wildlife Wednesdays that are recorded on our YouTube and website and Facebook. Our proposal 199, thank you to all who signed on that and commented. And that is to get traps 50 yards off of popular trails in the Matsu Basin. 
that'll be going to the board of games starting this weekend. So we'll hear you soon on that. And Blue Market is a zero waste group in Alaska, in Anchorage um, specifically. And if you're in Anchorage, you should check them out. They have a big focus on reducing plastics in the environment, especially the marine environment. So we are their charity of choice for the first three months of the year and 1% of their proceeds will go to us. So you should check them out. And our wildlife calendars are for sale. Find them on our website or reach out to us on social media and we can get you hooked up. And those feature photographs um, from wonderful local talented uh, photographers and features local Alaskan wildlife. Again, thank you so much to our members. If you would like to be a member and support this work, it's as little as $35 a year and it goes 100% towards taking care of making sure that Alaska's wildlife is being scientifically and ethically managed. So we greatly appreciate uh, your really support towards that mission. So if you're interested in helping, aside from that, there's those op options down below, Amazon Smile, Pick, Click, Give, um, that also contributes and helps a whole bunch. And I'm going to hand it off to Todd. It's his time to shine. So uh, tuck in and I hope everyone enjoys learning more about hummingbirds in South Central Alaska. Cool, thank you, Kelsey. I'm gonna wait just for a little bit while you clear out the waiting room. There was a question that was starting to <laughs> build up there. Here they come. All right, let me start sharing. And we got this one here, let's see. And over to here. All right. Can you see, see the screen okay from your end? Yes, that looks perfect. Great. Perfect. Well, you know, thank you, Kelsey and Julia and the, the AWA crew. And I also, I got to do a few more thank yous before we get started, just because. Um, you know, my bosses at the at the refuge are awesome. They let me reach off of the refuge a little bit to do this work um, with the expectation that someday we will start to see Anna's hummingbirds on, on the Kenai Refuge. But um, to understand what they're doing a, a little bit ahead of time, they're, they're giving me just a little bit extra leeway. Um, I also need to thank the two other hummingbird banders in Alaska, um, Kate McLaughlin, with the Alaska Hummingbird Project and Gwen Ballas down in Southeast with the Forest Service because they graciously let me into the club and, and have shared a lot of their knowledge with me. So it, it helped me formulate my project a lot better. Um, and then in order to talk about Anna's on the Kenai, I really needed to reach out um, well beyond the boundaries of, of South Central. And so I have to thank uh, Judy Klein down in Puget Sound for sharing some wonderful photos with me. John Moran at the um, Rocky Point Bird Observatory in BC and um, who else? Steve Heinel down in Southeast as well. So anyway, with that, um, Anna's hummingbirds are new to the Kenai from, from our birder perspective. And, and if you're not familiar with Anna's, everybody's Everybody who knows about hummingbirds in Alaska is familiar with Rufus hummingbird, which is our only hummingbird. But um, now we're starting to see Anna's hummingbirds. And Anna's hummingbirds are considered a, a medium-sized hummingbird with a relatively short straight bill. And they weigh, uh, most of the hummingbirds I catch are about 4.5 grams, maybe up to 5 grams. And to give you a good perspective, that's uh, the weight of a U.S. nickel is, is exactly five grams, so slightly less than a nickel. Um, but that's, that's an Anna's hummingbird. They're, they're one of the smallest birds I've ever handled. And um, I want to tell you some cool stuff about my project. But before we do that, I kind of need to give you the background of how the history of Anna's and how they how they moved um, up towards Alaska. 
And my wife said, I'm always teasing because I put these really cool pictures up and then I'm gonna show you a bunch of boring graphs, but I, I don't find them boring. And I promise you, if you hang on just a little bit, we'll get to uh, really cool pictures. So the story of Anna's hummingbird, um, Turn of the century, Anna's hummingbirds were restricted to Baja, California, maybe up into, into the very edge of Southern California. By the 1930s, they'd moved up and they were fairly well established in, in Southern California. Um, by 1950, we had, we had Northern California as the, as the Northern boundary of, of, of Anna's hummingbird territory. And then, in about 2000, we started really seeing them push further north into Oregon, Washington, British Columbia. Um, they're really hard to survey from, from a standpoint of, you know, I've been studying birds in Alaska for, for quite a few years. And we have some of these standardized um, survey methods that we would use like um, breeding bird surveys. They're done in June. Um, Christmas bird count is one that, that happens in the winter time to look at wintering birds. And it turns out these Annas are, are semi, mostly non-migratory, um, but they seem to show up heavier in the winter time. So uh, a June survey isn't going to give you a very good picture of, of Anna's hummingbirds. So um, with that, I will switch to just looking at, at what happened in Washington and utilizing the Christmas bird count data that we had available. And what you see is that there were a small number of Annas. Uh, just to back up, Christmas bird count is a, is a one day count in a 25, di 25 mile diameter circle, usually around a populated area where people are. And that count circle is broken up into various zones and um, it's a really awesome citizen science um, survey that's been going on for well over 100 years. They focus on these urban areas because that's where people are. And these counts then are compiled. And so what we're looking at is these Christmas bird counts for the entire state of Washington uh, from 2000 until, until 2020. And what you see is this kind of slow, steady increase till about 2010, and then what appears to be a much more rapid increase. And this is a, this is a profile that we see in the wildlife world a lot. After a large scale fire, you don't expect moose populations to just take off. They takes a couple of years before browse comes up and then it takes a couple of years for them to start producing twins and have healthier moose. And you don't see that exponential growth till about eight years after a big fire when the first babies that were born from those moose age to a point where they can now breed and now they're producing young and you get this kind of exponential growth. And that's what we're, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm speculating a lot, but that's what we kind of see in this profile is that you see this kind of steady increase till about 2010, and then a much more rapid increase. And my guess is you finally reach that critical mass where there was enough birds overwintering, they started breeding, and then their youngsters got to an age and they started breeding and, and we see much more rapid of an increase. But it's pretty fascinating to watch that happen in Washington state. And what that produces for the folks in Washington is these wonderful views. Um, again, these were photos uh, provided by Judy Klein to me. And this is, you know, December 20th. Um, and you just see this wonderful mix of, of immature birds. And I think this is probably an adult male or maybe an in, immature male here on the far left, but they're all sitting around uh, waiting uh, for their morning breakfast. You know, they're, they're huddled around the feeder here. And this is a regular occurrence now throughout Washington as, as people put up feeders, 
um, and as hummingbirds are coming, coming year round. Then uh, when you have a snow event and a cold event, like, like they recently had at Christmas time, then you have, you know, feeders that are freezing up and people who have heated feeders get a bunch more birds and birds who were entertaining themselves in the urban landscape, hitting flowers and things like that, come and get sucked into the feeders for a little bit to get a, to get a boost. And Judy estimated she had 75 to, to 80 hummingbirds coming during that little cold snap they had. It looks to me pretty similar to pictures I saw at SeaTac Airport of all the people standing around trying to get a flight back to Alaska. So this is um, funny, funny uh, to, to think about the hummingbirds just grouped around like this. But this is what Washington is, is seeing now with this push of Anna's hummingbirds into Washington. And if we bump up further north just a little bit to British Columbia, they have a very similar profile. And I probably, I should have mentioned very early on that if you're having trouble, if your little screen pop-up is covering up any part of the graph, you can just go and, and move that and um, see parts of the screen that, that you might be missing. I also want to mention that I have two different lines on this graph. On the left, you have the number of annas that were counted. But there's always a concern that you have more people counting, so they turned up more annas. And the right-hand scale, which corresponds to the orange line, is divided by the number of, of or the amount of effort that was put in. And so you can see it pretty closely matches that this wasn't a this wasn't a function of many more people doing counts. And so the number of annas went up. It's actually um, scaled by the effort. We we still see we have a, a huge increase in annas. And the count of annas in Washington was um, the effort or, or count per effort was about 0.6 birds per hour. Um, British Columbia is up now getting up into 0.8. But you see that same profile. There was kind of a steady increase, a slow steady increase, and then and then a kind of a boom starting in 2010 or 11. Um, so that kind of fits with what we saw in Washington. And in British Columbia, they are fortunate enough to be able to find some Anna's nest. And so um, the folks at Rocky Point have been studying Anna's hummingbirds down there and, and shared some of their information with me. But this is a just a beautiful shot of a Anna's hummingbird. This is a very typical hummingbird nest, um, mostly made out of spider webs and um, little bits of moss and stuff, but all tied together with spider webs, so it has the elasticity to to allow the two baby hummingbirds to grow in there. And then they decorate the outside with these cool little bits of lichen. So um, it's not like your typical nest um, sparrows or or warblers where they're all lined with this with grass and everything. Um, you should be able to see the difference between a hummingbird and a and a and a other songbird nest. But anyway, this is a great shot, and you'll notice the date there, uh, February tenth, um, sitting tight on a nest, and and that is pretty typical now. Um, Anna's hummingbirds seemingly try to get their nesting season done before Rufus returned from Mexico. So they found a little a little niche where they're nesting in late January through March and April. And then when Rufus come back, they're all done. They're all done nesting. And here's just one more great shot that John Moran took. I think I'm thinking this might be an alder, but I it's that's outside of my eco zone a little bit, but this is a fledgling. It's getting ready to getting ready to fledge. And you can see the the bill is much shorter. It's brown overall, and you can even see the the couple of the little pin feathers, the flight feathers, just coming in. Um, so this bird is is getting ready to leave the nest, but hasn't ever hasn't ever flown yet. So 
that date is March 24th. Um, we are not thinking about nesting songbirds up here in Alaska that time of year. Um, so then if we switch over to Alaska Christmas bird count, we see kind of a similar trend, but we're delayed a little bit. Um, Oregon and Washington had this, had this slow steady increase till about 2010, 2012, and then a sharp uptick. We kind of see that here, but the number of birds we're talking about, we had 41 or 42 birds total statewide, but that's a significant increase from what we were seeing for the decade before. So we are seeing a push into Alaska. Most of the numbers of these birds on Christmas bird count are southeast. Um, but I'll show you from my banding results that that we're actually we're actually seeing the benefit of those birds here on the Kenai Peninsula as well. And just a couple of nice shots from the Kenai. This is 2015. We started seeing a few more birds showing up and and a typical response when people see birds, you see this is October. Um, you know, as soon as people see a hummingbird, they're like, I want to put up hummingbird feeder, right? And, and so um, we started seeing birds more consistently annually in the fall and in about 14, 15, started getting a lot more photos and reports. And then now we're starting to see Anna's showing up even in the summertime for the folks in Seward and places where they have rufus that breed there. They have their feeders up all summer. And now we're starting to get, to get occasional summer reports of, of Anna's hummingbirds. So it's just fascinating to, to watch that shift. Um, so in 2018, as I started to see this increasing number of Anna's, and I saw what was going on down the, the Pacific Northwest and BC, and I started getting more reports on the Kenai, I said, gosh, I want to figure out what's going on with Anna's and um, what are we, what, what does the future hold for Anna's in a place like the Kenai Peninsula where winter weather has been getting warmer and, and we're starting to see more birds. So, so I set out to do this project and the first thing I wanted to do was determine if, if Anna's were actually surviving through the winter in South Central Alaska. The second thing I want to do is figure out some way of counting them because, you know, I didn't know early on whether these six reports from a one mile area in Homer were representing one individual bird that was moving around and hitting all those feeders, or did I have six different birds? And Christmas bird count wasn't giving me any of that kind of information. So uh, I, I, sought, I sought another way to try to figure out how many birds were actually attempting to overwinter on the Kenai or dispersing to the Kenai. And then the last thing I wanted to do was use hummingbirds as a way to engage in meaningful conversation about climate change because, you know, we see all the doomsday reports of, of the different things we're going to lose. And I thought, what better way to reach some of my friends who, who either, you know, just accept what happens or, or don't believe that we have an ability to change it. Um, what better way to engage them than to look at something positive rather than, than always negative. So that was one of my, one of my challenges that I, that I really wanted to draw into this project. 2018, I had been a bird bander all over the state, probably had banded 30,000 songbirds, but I never had banded hummingbirds. It takes special certification. And I went down to Idaho and stayed, a, I did about a week-long training trip with, with what ended up being the best mentor that I could have, Fred Bassett. And we traveled all around Idaho and hit the the Rudine Ranch where they, they do big hummingbird roundups and um, gave me a, a unique opportunity to handle most of the Western hummingbird species 
on that road trip. And I got to focus on Rufus, which is what at the time, what I believed would probably be one of the only species I, I got a ban. So great trip in summer 2018. And then I got my permit to ban. And, and a lot of my friends are like, what is banding? I don't understand what you're talking about. Well, bird banding is um, the process of capturing a wild bird and putting a uniquely numbered leg band on it. And that is pretty easy to see on a robin. But when you bump down to the size of a hummingbird, you can see from this photo, the bands are microscopic. And while hummingbirds are a lot tougher than you'd think, they are pretty fragile. And, and thus, it really is important to have the, the special training. But that unique number goes into the bird banding lab database. And if anybody anywhere in the country catches or finds that bird dead or whatnot, they will know exactly where and when we banded the bird and, and a lot of the specifics. So banding is just a way of, of marking or giving a bracelet to a bird um, that allows you, it doesn't allow you to track where, where it was in the meantime, but it, it allows you to track where you banded it and if the band is ever reported back to you. So I started a, a banding project focusing on trying to see how many Anna's hummingbirds were actually coming to the. And these are just a couple other shots of the process here. You can see uh, this is actually from my Rufus banding work because it's really hard to get photos of yourself when you're trying as hard as you can to, to do a great job not harming this bird, getting the information you need and then, and then releasing it unharmed um, and unimpeded you don't have a lot of time to take pictures. So you have some great pictures from the Wildlife Conservation Center in Portage where I do Rufus hummingbird banning. And just a great shot of showing that I think it's important if we are to enter into these projects, um, there's nothing better than than sharing that with the public and, and sharing it with kids because they are not gonna wanna read our peer reviewed articles on, on what we found. So as I as I bombed around the first year, I 2018. Remember, I just got I just got permitted in summer of 2018. In fall 2018, which is typically when Anna's show up on the Kenai, is August through January. Um, 2018, I was able to to track down two Annas that were coming to feeders, one in Kenai and one in Homer, and get bands on them. And the Kenai bird stuck around till Christmas Eve, I believe, was the last time they saw that bird. Um, 2019, I banded two more in Kenai. And, you know, at this point, I'm not thinking this project's going that well because I only banded two and I didn't recapture either one of them um, in the subsequent year. And then I banded two more and I'm thinking, you know, chances are most of these birds aren't making it, but I don't have a very good sample size at this point. And then 2020, we started getting a few more birds and I managed to capture eight. At the time I, you know, it's a two hour drive for me to get down to Homer. And I did ban six down in Homer. We estimated from other reports that there were probably maybe as many as a dozen in Homer um, that fall. And then this year it was just chaos. It started, started right away. Even in July, I was getting reports of Anna's hummingbirds and I managed to ban 24 uh, before the cold snap hit. And we will have to wait and see if any of those show back up next year. But we did start to see reports in other places like Cooper Landing and Nikiski. And uh, I managed to manage to catch a few birds in all of those communities. So total now I've banded 36 Annas uh, in the last four years, but obviously most of those were, were this year, um, this past, past fall. And 
as you would expect with any kind of pioneering species, typically the immature males, the teenagers, let's call them, teenage males are the ones that, that, do, the, that do the exploring. And that's, you know, pretty well represented in my breakdown. And I like to throw a few codes at you just so you learn um, what we're talking about. This AHY is a code for after hatching year male. So the very first year that this bird is born, let's just, let's just speculate it was born in British Columbia in mid-February and fledged in mid-March, that entire rest of the year would be its hatching year. So those would be hatch year males. And then after January 1st, it would be in its after hatching year. And, and so you can see adults or after hatching year, we got a few, but predominantly in, a, in an expanding population and a pioneering population, you expect more hatch year males. And that's, that's definitely what we're seeing. And that, so, you know, getting back to my original objectives of trying to determine if Annas are surviving in South Central Alaska, I would have to say the jury is still out. Um, we have not recovered any. We did in 2015, before I started banding, we had a person in Homer who reported Annas at their feet or all the way through the end of March. Um, so we do believe that they're capable of overwintering in Homer. Uh, I haven't found any in my banding yet, um, but I just threw 24 more bands out there. So um, we'll hope that some of those birds may be moved across the bay into warmer areas. And then next fall or summer, I will, I will pick up one of those banded birds and then we'll have true confirmation that, that birds are surviving South Central in the winter time. But I have not documented it yet, um, but I've had a lot of fun uh, running around, chasing down these hummingbird reports and meeting some really cool people and, and having some really good conversation about hummingbirds, climate change, what to feed, how to feed, what to plant, all kinds of different stuff. So, um, it's been a it's been a fascinating ride so far, and and I hope to continue doing that as as the number of hummingbirds continues to increase coming to the Kenai. I will have to modify to where I'm not running all over the place to try to ban them all. I am going to have to come up with a little bit more concise strategy. At this point, I the the numbers are few enough that I can still. Um, attempt to band everyone, but we will continue to see Anna's coming and probably in a volume that I'm, I'm going to have to redesign what my sample looks like. As for the, as for the minimal cap banding count versus the other survey methods, this is fascinating because of the winners that I banded Anna's in Homer or Kenai, Birds were seen all the way till about mid-January, maybe even towards the end of January, and then they all kind of disappeared. And in 2020, when we had a relatively mild winter down in Homer, all the birds disappeared, even though the last time I captured them, they were in very good shape. They were, they were fat and healthy, and nothing had changed in the, in the weather, and then they all disappeared. And we don't know if those birds have decided that it's time to start nesting because, you know, end of, uh, end of January, that's nesting time down in British Columbia. So a lot of these birds may feel the urge to start nesting. They staked out this feeder for a long time. No females showed up. And so they're out of here. Um, or they just reached that thermal limit where they couldn't, couldn't keep things going, but I find that hard to believe in, in some of those situations because literally I caught the bird in October and it was 4.8 grams and I caught it in mid-January and it was 4.8 grams and then three days later it disappeared. So I really don't think the health of the bird was, 
was being challenged yet at that point. So um, we'll just have to keep doing this for a little bit while, you know, a little while longer. But what was fascinating was that our count from banding told us that in some cases, birds are making the rounds and they're, they're hitting several houses in a, I don't know, maybe three miles, two to three miles was the, was the largest gap that I saw between birds that I banded at one house and caught them at another house. But typically they're not doing a lot of that moving and they're sticking around at the same house. Um, by Christmas time though, when the, you know, roughly whenever the Christmas bird count happens, those birds are moving all around and some of them are in the count circle and some of them are gone. And so in 2020, I banded eight in Homer all fall and there was only three recorded on the, on the Christmas bird count. That, you know, there's a bunch of reasons that could have happened, but, but the one thing was it gave me a really, really good confidence that, you know, I documented eight Annas and Homer uh, attempting to overwinter that they had dispersed there. And it gave me a sense of, of what the Christmas bird count number means to um, that one day snapshot versus, versus the whole fall. This fall, I banded 17 in Homer, and we had that brutal, brutal November, which was probably, you know, more typical of, of the Kenai, what I grew up with. Um, but it's, it was definitely much colder and, and abnormal to what we've seen recently. And by Christmas bird count time, there were zero, um, zero found on the Christmas bird count. So there was a ton of Annas all through until early November and, and then they just vanished. And so we'll have to see if some of those made their way across the bay and they, I have gotten a few reports from Halibut Cove that there's still Annas over there. So it will be interesting to see if some of our Homer Annas found, found safe harbor somewhere and, and come back next year or whether it's kind of a, a dead end spot until, until the climate continues to change just a little bit more. And then my last, my last objective of this project was to, you know, talk to folks about climate change and what we've seen on the Kenai with other birds. We have seen a ton of other birds come. Very hard to document a true decline in a bird because a lot of species fluctuate up and down and, and we have 2 million acres we're looking at. So we don't really have survey methods that that get at that question of, did you lose 50% of the Wilson's warblers? But we do have, we do see the movement of new species into the refuge. And so things like Stellar's Jays and um, Golden Crown Kinglets. When I started my career, Golden Crown Kinglets were a very late, late fall migrant that passed through the refuge. Now they're breeding almost anywhere that there's spruce on the Kenai. And we also see um, a handful of Pacific wrens and other, and, and you'll see a, a common theme that a lot of these bird species are from Southeast Alaska and they're now making their way to, to the Kenai. But anyway, I wanted to use the input of Anna's hummingbirds as just a marker to help people understand that we are we are seeing a lot of change on the Kenai and right now it's the species that that can adapt very quickly or don't adapt at all we see those going away and we see other birds you know mostly bird species coming in because they're mobile um, but but four-legged critters aren't nearly as mobile as a bird so um, we're not seeing that movement and so you know, as we start to see all these changes happening, we, we, we really need to think about what future we want to see. And, and it was really good that um, Kelsey mentioned RAD. We like to use acronyms with the government, but resist, resist accept, direct decision-making process. As a, as a traditionally trained biologist, I grew up with finding special places and wanting to hang on to those places. That's, 
that's what we did. We studied everything we could and we did everything we could to maintain that, that perfect place in its original um, ecosystem process, original species delineations, assemblages, but we're in a we're in a time of change that that's really not uh, a method that's going to serve us well because the change is happening too too fast for um, our traditional decision making processes. So RAD is just a, a way of helping managers decide whether we're going to resist, accept, or direct change. And you know the last last little story I tell you is if you think about um, a wetland habitat that used to be this perfect puddle duck habitat and you just get a couple inches of sea, sea um, level rise, that puddle duck habitat is now all brackish water and it's really not great for, for those puddle ducks and it's getting too deep and the food's not there anymore. We, we have an option to resist that. We can go and build dikes and try to maintain this freshwater system. We can just accept that it's gonna change and then watch it evolve over the next 50 years or whatever it takes to, to find um, some kind of stasis. Or we can direct that change and be intelligent about it and say, you know what, this is not gonna be puddle duck habitat anymore. We are going to dig this out deeper. We're going to put some clams in here and we're going to make this diving duck habitat. And we're going to build new puddle duck habitat over here where the where the sea level rise isn't going to affect it. And so in that thought process, I look back at, at Anna's hummingbirds and I go, well, I could tell you right now what we're going to do. We're going to direct because the process of putting out hummingbird feeders and, and doing everything we can to support them you know, is is having a positive effect on their on their occurrence here. And um, anyway, just wanted to I wanted to throw that out there because I think people need to be talking about climate change. And and when you start, you know, when you have a homesteader that hasn't seen a hummingbird in forty years on the Kenai, and now they have three hummingbirds flitting around their garden, they're asking me why am I seeing this? And you know, it's. Um, it's a good question. Is is climate change um, part of that? Undoubtedly, we do not live in a in a habitat that ever or Anna's hummingbirds in October, November, December. Um, but you know, we we do now. So so there's a climate change component, not only here, but British Columbia and Washington where they didn't used to have Anna's hummingbirds breeding twice a year and, and pumping out all these youngsters. So, so undoubtedly there's a climate change component. We also see them congregating in, in urban areas where we have put all these plantings in, where we're putting up feeders to help support them. So supplemental feeding definitely has um, a stake in that um, why we're seeing Anna's in South Central, and then just awareness, you know, with, I, I have a hummingbird banding Facebook group, hummingbird banding on the Kenai Peninsula, and so I get all these reports from folks that are seeing hummingbirds and want to see if I can come ban their hummingbird. The, the technology, and as we, as we talk to folks and, and spread the word, more and more awareness, um, of hummingbirds on the Kenai happens. And so I get a lot more reports. So, you know, all these complex systems always have a mishmash of all these drivers. Um, so I would never, I would never sit here and tell you that they're here just because of climate change. They're, it's a it's a complex system and it's all of the above, but but climate change definitely has a has a component in it. And the last thing I wanted to, you know, I, I tell people I'm not big on, I'm really not big on touting myself. I like records and I like to share records, but the records are not mine. The records are the hummingbirds. So um, we did ban the northern and westernmost Anna's hummingbird ever this past fall. And that was in South Anchorage. 
And the only reason it's the, the northern and westernmost hummingbird record banded is because I didn't drive up to the valley where somebody else also had, had Anna's hummingbirds this fall. So um, that's a record to be broken, but it is just kind of novel to see that that we're get continuing to see Anna's reports and they're, they're spreading out even more. I got a report from Dillingham um, last year as well. So, so Anna's are moving. I will certainly break my record at some point until we get a hummingbird bander up in Fairbanks and, and Anna's continue that march. And then we did also just this past fall band Acosta's hummingbird in Kenai which is, again, the northern and westernmost um, Costa's record. But Costa's hummingbirds breed in desert eastern California, right? So, so we're starting to see Costa's show up on the Kenai as well with a little bit more regularity. And so it's fascinating to see, try to understand what that process is, is, is the conditions failing them in, in their native habitat, are they doing super well down there? And so they're kicking out more of these um, hatchier males that, that pioneer and disperse to new areas. Don't know, but it's a, it's a fascinating record and, and a much, much smaller hummingbird than an than a Anna's. And that's what I have for you at the moment. I do have a little teaser here that we do a summer hummer banding event at the Wildlife Conservation Center in Portage. It'll be June 4th this year. Last year, um, Kate McLaughlin with the Alaska Hummingbird Project came over and we co-banded co and led banding demonstrations. And if you haven't been there, it's a, it's a, wonderful, um, it's a wonderful event and a great place to come and see Rufus hummingbirds. And with that, I'll turn it back to you, Kelsey, for questions. Wonderful, thank you so much. Um, we have tons of questions. That's cool, I'll good. leave the screen up for a couple more questions in case anybody wants to write down my contact info. Um, totally feel free to, to email or call me. I may not be able to answer the phone immediately, but I will call you back, so. That's great, thank you. Um, I'm sorry if I missed it. I Did you mention what the little blue dots are on top of their heads? Ooh, Is that thank you for, you know college? what, thank you for asking because I did have it in my notes and I, I did not talk about it. So one thing that hummingbird banders will often do, and, and I'm authorized for a couple of different colors, you'll see different colors elsewhere, but often when we come and band a hummingbird, we will put a little blue dot, well, other people have different colors, pink, orange, blue, you know, blue, whatever. I often will use blue and it's um, water soluble white out um, that's, that's dyed blue. And the reason is when I band the hummingbird, you can never see the band on their legs, almost never. Every once in a while, they will land on a feeder and you can just barely see a, a band on the right leg. But if I put a little blue dot in there, the homeowners who, who are hosting the feeder can keep an eye out and they can say, oh, yep, that's that same guy that we already banded last week or the week before. Um, usually it lasts for uh, maybe a month or so unless the bird molts. And then when they molt, they get a whole new set of feathers and, and my blue dot goes away. But, but the beauty of it is I don't have to handle that bird again. Um, I can really cut down on handling if I know that it's already a bird I caught. But if they see an influx of new birds that don't have dots, then I probably need to go back out and, and visit their place again. So good question. Very cool. Um, awesome. That's awesome. So just start at the top here. First come, first serve. Um, what are these birds eating aside from at the feeders? Super good question. Um, you know, we often think about hummingbirds as these little nectar sippers and they drink all the sugar water and we put out feeders with the exact um, sugar concentration to try to match what, what wildflowers are doing. But all the reports I'm reading are anywhere from 60 to 80% of their diet is insects. And 
what you know it, it makes sense if you think about it we could not survive um just eating gatorade day in and day out it's a it's a high energy food source that gives them enough um energy to catch more bugs and so in in december we don't have a lot of flying bugs around and so these little annas are uh, working their way around the spruce trees and they're gleaning little frozen spiders and, and soft-bodied flies from the spruce trees. Um, sometimes they're picking them out of spider webs even, um, leftovers that were, that were frozen in a spider web. But we've seen, we've seen Anna stay away from the feeder for up to a week um, in areas where they were just on a walkabout and they went and fed, you know, on native insects and then came back to the feeder and topped up and, and then off they went again. So super good question. Wow. Frozen bugs and spiders. I, That's amazing. I, I'd stick to the hummingbird feeder myself, but. <laughs> It'd be a lot easier. Um, let's see. So that answers Linda's question. What natural food sources could they be finding in winter? Um, any theories as to what is driving their range expansion? You know, there's a lot of, there was a lot of discussion early on as they moved through California. And there was, um, I can't remember, it was a eucalyptus tree that became very popular and planted throughout, um, throughout areas of California. And there was a pretty strong belief that it seemed to be that they were tied to the fact that they had food sources during alternate times of the year with, with that. And, you know, it makes some sense if you look at the map that, you know, predominantly we see them on the coast in these communities in Seattle, in Olympia, Washington, in Southern Vancouver, British Columbia, there's a lot of houses. And we're also planting a lot of ornamental flowers and different things that can grow outside of the, outside of the normal flowering season for that eco zone so so undoubtedly that is helping um helping drive them you know into uh, support them into new areas um but you know as to as to what really prompted the the big pushes i don't know it's just that it's very common to see that critical mass reached and when they start breeding then you see you see them take off and we've, we've definitely seen that, you know, up, up to Southern British Columbia anyway. Wow, that's fascinating, that's amazing. The things those little bodies can do just is pretty mind blowing. Yeah, and we didn't even, you know, some of the biology of, of what allows them to survive the winter in Alaska, I mean, we have dark here on the Kenai for what? 15 hours and they don't feed in the dark, right? So, yeah. so hummingbirds have had to um, rely on torpor, kind of a mini hibernation every night because their metabolism is so high that if they didn't eat for 15 hours, they would be dead. And so they go into a kind of a, it's called torpor. They lower their body temperature. They lower their heart rate down. And some estimates are they save up to 90% of, of their uh, energy that would have been required if they were at their full metabolic rate. So they do that and then they go into, you know, they go into the stasis all night. And then when it gets light and they can feed again, then they, they come out of torpor, they shiver and get their, get their body going again and, and ramp back up. Um, but we'll see we'll see birds that go into torpor even at the feeders and you'll you'll find them hanging there we had we had one host in homer that found one laying on the ground and and they thought it was dead it was it looked like it was and it was actually partially frozen to the ground and when they pried it from the ground and and took it inside it warmed up and came out of torpor and and they went back outside and let it go and it flew off but basically they have to find a safe perch to clamp onto to go into torpor. And this one probably tried to go into torpor up underneath their, their um, carport. And then the wind came up and, and blew him off and he landed down in the snow. So 
Um, they're amazingly tough and and yet super super fragile. Oh my gosh, <laughs> I need like hand warmers and <laughs> I feel so <laughs> pathetic. Well, and that's the you know that's one of the the commitment that people make when they do put up a feeder is great. Now I got this Anna's hummingbird coming to my feeder, and it's November, and this morning it was seven degrees how am I going to keep this feeder from freezing and and it is a it is a strong commitment and I also encourage people to to fully understand that most of these birds probably aren't going to make it and you can help them with a feeder but if that's going to cause you angst to watch nature happen in front of you and maybe that guy doesn't make it or that guy doesn't make it don't do it you know, don't put up a feeder if you're not um, if you're not emotionally able to accept what the end result may be. That's very good advice. Um, I have one last quick question. I think we can squeeze in, but it is coming up on eight o'clock. Um, to be respectful of everyone's time, if you have to jump off, totally understand. But um, Todd, it is up to you if you want to stick around to answer a few more questions, or if you have to wrap up at eight as well. Um, Oh, I am totally free to add a little extra time as long as you want to keep keep asking him. Yeah, and if anyone has to jump off early, um, can't get your question answered um, while you are on, feel free to, I actually highly encourage you to reach out to Todd on his contact information there. Um, there's some amazing questions. We're going to try to get to as much as we can tonight, but um, if you're worried your question won't get answered, or if you have another one, please reach out to Todd. It's um, an amazing topic and lots of great questions are coming in. So I would hate to miss out. Um, so the next question then, I'll move on. Any reports on sightings in Kodiak? I think there is, I think there is an Anna's report, but the fascinating thing about Kodiak and I, and I I only learned this because I started pouring into some of the amazing modeling that was done looking at Rufus hummingbirds. And Rufus hummingbirds um, with, a, with a three degree Celsius change, um, they, Audubon did a, did a modeling exercise to look at the viability of habitat for Rufus. And, and if anybody doesn't know about Rufus, they've, they've declined about 60% um, over the last 30 years or so, their, their, their global population. But Alaska is still doing really good for Rufus. Um, and so they, the predictions are that Rufus will continue to move north a little bit, move into the Kenai Refuge, maybe even move across the, across the inlet into Lake Clark. But on the tail end, they're going to really continue to take it in the shorts and their habitat's really not going to be supporting them that well. And so as I looked into that, I looked in like Kodiak, still not mentioned as Rufus hummingbird habitat. And I talked to a couple of folks there. They had a, they had a Rufus hummingbird that overwintered last year, but, but Kodiak is not on, the, not on the flyway for Rufus hummingbird habitat. And it's kind of surprising to me because habitat wise, it's very similar to what you find in Prince William Sound, which is just a just a haven right now for for rufus hummingbird so yeah i don't know kodiak's off the list but they have uh they have documented them there I, I believe but it's it's not on the not on the hummingbird list is a great spot yet uh, next we had a question is it hurting the birds by leaving feeders out in winter and maybe straining them or preventing migration yeah this comes up a lot and um Birds are not, most bird species are not dictated by food. So you can put all the food out you want. And when the photo period or whatever trigger kicks the hormones in that it's time to migrate, the bird's out of here. And, and so you don't actually keep them there. Uh, it, it, it happens, you know, the question comes up all the way down their migration zone. And, and it's a fair question. We don't want to do anything to hurt birds. Um, but, but feeders are not keeping them there. If you 
with annas being mostly non-migratory, they have dispersed here and they would probably die quicker without your feeder. Maybe, maybe not, but you wouldn't enjoy seeing them because you might see them flip by your house once and they're not gonna stick around. They're gonna move, all, move along until they find a food source. So, so putting out feeders does help them and it's something that, that you can enjoy, but you're not keeping them there. Um, and I don't know, there are a couple of species. I think there's probably some duck, duck species that, that you know, we've seen where a food source might keep them there longer. But even most duck species, it doesn't matter how much corn you put out, eventually they're gonna go, it's time to, it's time to head down the flyway, so. Um, but but it is important if you do feed that you, you know, you have to keep the feeders clean. Black mold spores in the feeder, um, un, unkept feeders will kill hummingbirds in a very painful way um, by swelling up their throats. The, the spores get lodged in the back of their throat and then they, they basically suffocate and, and the other part of that is we live in Alaska, there's bears. If you don't have a safe place to, to put out sugar water because bears are around, don't do it. You know, we, we don't want to do anything to cause um, additional problems. So, so, you know, feeding is not for everybody. And if, if you choose that you want to put out flowers, there's uh, several species that seem to draw in um, annas late in the year. Um, nasturtiums are one that, that seems to, to do really well in most cases late into the year and can be a big draw for, for annas. But just know that when, when you hit that really cold snap, um, somebody with a heated feeder will, will still be enjoying their annas for a while and, and, and you won't be. Good to know. Uh, great, thank you. Um, Next question, um, why don't you form an HB club to assist you? I'm not quite sure what that means. Um, do you, Todd, is that I do not. I do not know what HB is standing for in that case. I do have, um, you know, I did start up a Facebook group called Hummingbird Banding on the Kenai Peninsula, and, and it was basically my attempt to collect up all the people who were either putting out feeders or wanted to put out feeders and get the reports back to me because I was getting some reports from eBird, but there's so many birders or people that don't even consider themselves birders that are not using eBird. And so once I started that little group up, it really is aimed at, at folks on the Kenai or maybe up to Anchorage who, who want to entertain uh, having a feeder out but um, a lot of it's just been people tracking my, my escapades and, and adventures. And then a lot of nice, I've seen, seen a lot of nice interaction with folks sharing with other folks who didn't have the money to buy a heated feeder. And they're like, oh my gosh, how am I gonna, you know, I'm a slave to this feeder now. How can I, I I'm taking it inside and out every morning, every evening before dark. And, and now I'm switching them because they only get two hours before it starts feed, you know, freezing again. And um, So there's a lot of really good communication back and forth with, with folks that are trying to feed them here on the Kenai. Awesome, I'm sure that's HB meant hummingbird now that I think about it. Um, so I hope that answers your question, Leonard. Great. Do males share in incubating eggs and feeding chicks? Nope. <laughs> males, <laughs> males, they they find this really cool territory and they stake it out, and but they they really do a good job of supervising the female when she builds the nest, and and especially with Rufus, you really see it with Rufus that. At the Wildlife Conservation Center, Rufus are the first one in and they come and they stake out their territories and they're doing these really cool display flights. And then the females come in and they, you know, pick who impresses them and they start nesting. And the female goes and builds this nest and the male's like, whoa, you're doing a good job. And then once that process gets started and she's on eggs, he pretty much is like, all right, work's done here. And 
And so I had these really amazing periods in late June where all the males were starting to group together and they were hitting the feeder again because they're already headed south and, and the females are still on eggs. So I would hit, I'd have one day where it was like, I think I caught 53 male rufous hummingbirds at, at the Wildlife Conservation Center at, at one feeder. And then about a week or two later, then the females came off the nest and I caught like 63 females in one day at the Wildlife Conservation Center. And they were, they were swirling around, fattening up. And, and already by, by July 1st, the males are gone. And by mid-July, almost everybody else is gone. Wow. Wow, that's amazing, the wave of consistency like that um, because of the timing. Very cool. And the, the youngsters, you know, you think about these these birds were little jelly bean eggs and 35 days later they have wings and know how to fly but they're all of a sudden at that moment leaving the nest and starting to feed and heading for Mexico you know embarking on this this journey to Mexico um, because they they don't fly in flocks they're solo they they're not solo when they're sitting around a feeder fighting with each other over it but but as far as that migration goes, I hardly catch any youngsters because the first thing they seem to do is start moving up the alpine and, and hit the flowers, um, uh, you know, in the, in the Chugach and, and, and start heading south. But again, that's, that's um, rupus hummingbirds, not the, not the Anna's hummingbirds that are dispersing here and, and probably hanging on until they, they don't make it. But that's why we ban them. Maybe we get lucky someday and and one of them heads back to British Columbia and, and they catch it at Rocky Point and we find out that they're just coming to spend a, a late fall, early winter period in Homer and then they're going back to BC. I don't know, we'll, we'll, we'll have to wait and see on that. Wow, <laughs> after a month and a half to fly to Mexico, that's incredible. Um, do you know what triggers Anna's to breed in the Pacific Northwest? Is it daylight? the normal answer would be yes but what you annas are so weird because in british columbia you gotta you gotta realize they're rookies in this environment they just moved into british columbia now they're breeding people are studying them and they're going wow you know annas nest in january and march um but as you move further south they nest earlier so Anna's down in Arizona, they predominantly nest in November. But if you talk to the folks in Arizona, they're like, they mostly nest in November, but you could find a nest any month of the year. They, they, are, they adapt and modify in, in, in weird ways. So, so I wouldn't say that I know enough to, to say what triggers that. I mean, that is a normal that is a normal response in, in most birds, but I wouldn't say as plastic as Anna's are and able to adapt to new temperatures, new environments. I mean, you know, they started in, they started in desert Baja and now they're in the, the rainforests of in temperate zones of the, of the Western rainforest, right? And, and you know, those, those habitats are strikingly different and they were able to to adapt and modify and move into them. So hard to say if, if they fit the regular mold that other birds do, you know. Very good. Um, next question, what is the rate of recapture on banned hummingbirds? Say in Washington where there is higher abundance. In higher abundance areas, are recaptures enough to do a marked recapture for population abundance estimate or are core MR assumptions violated? I don't think they're doing straight mark recapture because the birds, you know, as I said, they're 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 mostly non-migratory, but you do see these um, elevational moves, and both in California and I know some of the banders in British Columbia told me that they'll have them down on the coast at the feeders, and then they'll move inland when they're done nesting 
and the rufous move into those same same habitats that the annas were in, but the annas are up valley and then and then you know come late summer they start moving their way back in. So so there's a lot of there's a lot of assumptions in your typical mark recapture study that we would violate grossly in in that process. But but I really don't know if they're using um, mark recapture in, a, in an estimate capacity like that. Um, and, and again, you know, we don't, we are only able to catch these hummingbirds because they're coming to a feeder. And that screws up your whole system when you're, when you're trying to do mark recapture in that, in that setting, as far as I understand. But um, we certainly don't have enough birds up here. I, I will catch my same birds periodically I think the longest I've had was a couple of months later but in the same in the same year so I haven't got them the next year but with rufous hummingbirds we're we're getting um I think Kate had return rates in in Prince William Sound of like 18 to 20 percent um, of her band of birds returned and I'm certainly seeing good rates like that at, at the Wildlife Conservation Center. So pretty high rate of return for, for wild bird. Good, great. Um, someone just wanted to let you know that they had an Anna's hummingbird at their house on the south side in Anchorage this September, late September, in case it helps your research at all. And that was getting nectar from a geranium that was a late bloomer. Um, so just... There was there was probably five or six at least reported in in um, in South Anchorage this fall, and honestly, the only reason I lucked into banding a couple of them was because my daughter had a dance performance in Anchorage, and I happened to be there for the weekend. But typically, I wouldn't I wouldn't probably drive that far just uh, just for one banding effort, and 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 I try to. You know, um, I try to do my best to reduce my carbon footprint too. And so when when I look at making a trip down to Homer, I try to line up as many um, different um, spots that I know I have unbanded birds, and I try to hit them all in one trip um, because I just don't want to be, um, you know, wasting the the time and gas to to repeatedly do that every time I hear about one. Um, I try to make it make it worth the effort. So uh, the best I had last year, I had one time where I banded five or six at one house in in Homer. She had, I think she had eight total, and I and I caught five or six of them. Um, and then I've had a couple trips where I I caught, I usually try to catch four or five on a trip and, and sometimes that's four or five different houses and sometimes that's one or two if I'm lucky and they have multiple birds. Um, let's see here. What about rufous populations in Alaska? Are they also expanding and are their populations maintaining? The best we can tell rufous are, are, are holding steady in Alaska so far. Um, But, you know, there's three of us banding rufus. And, and I wouldn't say that we have, we have the pulse on our little banding sites. And, and we certainly don't have the pulse on the whole, um, the whole South Coastal and Southeast region really that well as far as total numbers. But the indications are that they're, they're doing quite well in the South Coastal, Southeast region given the fact that there's been a 60% decline globally. But the models also indicate that even some of those strongholds like Prince William Sound will be less, um, the, the, popular, the habitat will support less rufous in the future. And so, you know, that was kind of one of the impetuses for me to start studying rufus is we're getting, we're getting more 
accidental or occasional reports of rufus on the western Kenai and on the refuge people are starting to see rufus more um, when they're out hiking in july and i think we're probably in that phase where they're just about ready to make the jump um, onto the refuge at least over to the homer side because they breed they breed all through seward and they breed inland now to just about moose pass they cut over at Portage to the Wildlife Conservation Center and they go around to Hope. And they've even probably been recorded as far as um, Bird Point, um, McHugh Creek area. There's been some, some evidence that they're breeding that far around. Um, so we'll know pretty quickly, you know, if people start seeing June as a critical month, if we start seeing Rufus hummingbirds in June on Hillside, then, then they're making that next little push, um, you know, west, west and north. So, um, yeah, it's 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 one of those things where you know I kind of the models predicted it. I kind of saw some precursors that made me think that they're going to move a little bit, and so um, I thought what better way to to go and study them here on the Kenai where they are and understand the timing, phenology, and return rates of, of the existing breeding population. So we can then look at the new population as they move and, and see if it's the same, see what, see what differences there are. Okay, great. Um, let's see. <laughs> this is a fascinating question. Um, I breed wingless fruit flies for my dart frogs already. Do you think hummingbirds would eat them from a feeder? <laughs> I think they would scarf them from a feeder if, <laughs> if you had a way to provide them that they didn't all just run away. Um, I don't know how you would do that, but, but it, and it's, it's, you know, I see people putting out our alternative food sources like fruit and stuff. And it's like, that never works here. And then all of a sudden you see, you know, some bird visiting it. And I'm like, hey, that's pretty cool. I'm glad you tried that. You know, um, I don't, I, I think they would benefit from the, from the food source, but um, yeah, I think you'd have trouble containing them in a way that they could eat them. And, and, and for sure they, there's nobody better at picking their, we, 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 we're not short of bugs in Alaska, I guess is, is the one thing I would say. We, we have an abundance of bugs and it's probably one of the reasons that birds are flying from, from South America to come up here to breed is that we have an abundance of bugs. Um, and, and I think if you did have a, a hummingbird feed, you know, if you, if you want to see hummingbirds, I think the easiest way is a, is a hummingbird feeder that's, that's maintaining clean, but hey, more power to you if you can find a way to provide the the fruit flies to them yeah and prevent invasive wingless fruit flies <laughs> that's that you know that's the you know i i was thinking that but i'm like gosh they're probably not going to survive the winter but you know yeah that's true birds do they do exist they, they always do anytime we're we monkey <laughs> uh that really got me thinking though that would be interesting um <laughs> So I do recognize it's coming up almost to 8.30. We still have several questions. Everyone's coming with some <laughs> really phenomenal questions. Um, Todd, do you want to stick around and answer them? Let's, we have about let's, four or five let's go. Yeah, let's go till 8.30 and then okay. make sure that folks, um, you know, if you didn't hear your question answered and and it's it's a, you know, a good, good valid question you want to answer too, just send me an email. Um, or drop me a text. I, I'm really tied up on my phone a lot um, these days, and I'm um, leaving for vacation for a couple weeks soon. So um, be patient with me, but I will, I will try to get back to you if, you if you send an email. So yeah, let's give it just another five minutes. Cool. All right. Uh, what do you know about the population numbers or the change in Anna's southernmost range? Not very much at all. Um, nothing that I don't know anything that you couldn't also read. I've I've never um, I've never interacted with anybody on that southern end. 
my focus has always been, you know, the Alaska population. And then not only when they made this push into Washington, BC, a little while after that, they started pushing to the east. And so um, I have some friends in Boise, Idaho, who are on a very similar track to the Kenai Peninsula, but they're maybe five years ahead of us. And anybody that lived, has lived in Boise knows they get pretty pretty rough winters as well. But but they started band, banding Anna's in winter in the in the Boise area. And then I think in 2019 they found their first um, active nest. And now they have a second nest that they've documented, um, Annas and Boise, and and they had banded wintering birds, but they were seeing survival, um, and they had banded. I think they had sixty birds banded or so before they found that first nest. Um, so you know, it just there's some real similarities on the Boise side of things to us, other than you know we're quite a bit further north and. And I just, you know, if we had a couple of winters here on the Kenai where we had no snow and, and the coldest it ever got was single digits, um, Anna's can survive that. Um, but um, not this winter. We were, we were into the minus 10s, minus 20s for an extended period of time. And they either had to move or, or they passed on. Be interesting to see if the southernmost range if they've decreased, if that would suggest that they're just shifting? I don't think they're shifting. I mean, you still see, you know, you can go into eBird, anybody, and that's the, you know, the beauty of eBird is you can go into eBird and you can hit explore and you can type in Anna's Hummingbird and you can look at the, her the hist history of the entire you know, area that Anna's have ever been spotted, or you can scale that back to just the last five years. And what we're seeing, you know, I mean, I have looked and there's still plenty of Anna's reports from, you know, Arizona, California, Baja region. So I don't think they've lost them, um, but we're seeing this, this broad expanse of individual birds all the way across the East Coast. I mean, they're, birds are, you know, birds are showing, Anna's hummingbirds are showing up um, I think there was one even in Pennsylvania that somebody banded um, a couple months ago. So, so you know, Anna's are expanding. There's, there's no doubt about it. And, um, and I just am, you know, living, living in the Great White North. I'm, I'm up here looking at the, at the northern end of the range and haven't really paid attention too much to the, to the southern. Um, I threw a link to eBird in the chat for those who are wondering what eBird is about or if you want to get more involved. Um, it is there. You can check it out. Yeah, um, and it's super easy. I, I use it to track rufous hummingbirds as they, as they come up from Alaska just by looking at the most recent reports. And you will often see rufous hummingbirds just, just a smattering of them. And all of a sudden, the next day, they're piled into to Seattle or piled into Vancouver and then they'll stall there for two or three weeks and and I'll call my friends and they'll say oh yeah the snow the snow load is all the way down to the beach and so they're just piled up here waiting for snow to pull back from the beach so that they have salmon berries or currants or some some kind of resource to continue on but it's Eber is phenomenal in that it's just citizen science people putting in their reports and at your fingertips, you can just see amazing things with, with just reports. Yeah, it's the power of, of people really, citizen science. Um, Reed asked, are they breeding in Alaska? And I'm not quite sure in reference to that, what that was. So um, it must well, be- Well, there's, yeah, there, so, so, you know, those Christmas bird count numbers, you know, 41 or 42 birds last year in Alaska, the, the most of those are Southeast Alaska and they definitely have bred. Um, I talked to, to several of my folks in Southeast and they're like, yeah, you know, I know they bred. Um, Gwen, who was banding, has banded a few Annas. 
said that she had individual birds that she spotted at the same house bird that she banded it it would disappear and come back off and on um i think for almost three years so so they are surviving there are certainly indications that they have bred but that's um probably that's you know we are we are reaching that thermal limit where they're going to do fine for a while and then we'll have a bad winter and and it'll scale everything back and then they'll start over again but the ecological pressure coming from Washington and British Columbia where they're just going like gangbusters now will just continue to send these attempts our way and and so you know I think catch can for sure um i i had one person in sitka told me that they were they were pretty confident they saw a breeding attempt just from the behavior of one of the females so awesome um kind of in that vein are there any reports of anna's nesting in southeast alaska i don't recall if they told me they actually ever found nests and and to be honest, I'm sitting over here in Seward and at AWCC banding, you know, last year I think I banded 280 rufus between Seward and, and Portage. I can't find a nest and they're nesting right there, right? So, so um, the advantage that some folks have in these, in these urban settings where they're keeping them year round is often those annas are nesting right in the one bush that they have in the yard or um, when you get down to California like you know you'll see you'll see annas nest underneath the eaves of a house you know on a string of Christmas tree lights they're they're taking advantage of that that human um, you know that human element and we don't see that up here but um, you know it's there's a lot more people looking too. You know, there's a lot more, there's a lot more Anna's in Washington and a lot more people looking. So um, I'm not convinced if I went to where Anna's were, you know, where a few nests were in Southeast that I would actually find a nest either. Um, they're, they're tough. I can't find any rufous nests and I'm, I keep trying. Oh, you got, you got muted there. Sorry, my dog was playing with his toy outside. <laughs> um, but when those nests are speckled with lichen, I, even in those wonderful photographs, it was very clear as day that they're impossible to, <laughs> to see. Yeah, and the first, the first nest I found in Idaho, I think it was, it was a little bit of a fluke, but it was, a, it was one of their banded birds. And it just so happened it nested in, in some kind of, fruit tree right outside uh, this woman's window. And she just happened to be at that right level and, and bam, spotted it, you know, saw it going in and out of there and, and, and you know, super good on her. She spotted this, you know, the first nesting record for, for all of Idaho. Um, I just don't have that kind of luck. <laughs> I, I was just sitting there. I mean, I've watched Rufus go into these spruce trees and I'm like, Doggone it, I know he's nesting in there and I will scour that thing and not be able to find a nest. But but typically you will see that hummingbird nests, they're not in the crook of a branch, like you know, we, we're used to a robin nest being right there in the crook. And and typically with, with hummingbird nests, you will see them be on the on the top of a branch, often with some kind of kind of overstory. And then they do, they decorate them with with lichens and darn near impossible to see. Hidden in plain sight. Um, our last question, I think it's a fun one to wrap up with. Um, you had mentioned nasturtiums attract annas and someone was wondering, can you name some other flowers? Um, are there any perennial or annual plants we can provide for our rufous hummingbirds? Well, two different things on the, two different things. Um, rufus, arrive in Rufus arrive in early May to the Kenai to to Seward um, late April early May so you know what they're looking for in a native habitat is 
salmon berries and currants because those guys flower before they even um, put out leaves in the, in a lot of cases. And so, um, and then, and then rufus are gone by mid July. So you're not going to have any problem attracting rufus if they happen by your area. It doesn't matter if you have delphiniums or whatever in late summer or for us, that's midsummer, right? And then they're headed south because they got a they got a long trip south. Anna's on on the other hand, they don't start showing up until August, August, September, October. And very few of us have any ornamentals that we plant that in September, late September are still going. So um, I found nasturtiums to be one of the cold hardy ones here on the Kenai that that works really well. Any, any plant that you have, any flower that you have, especially seemingly reds and reds and yellows and oranges, um, but that has a tube and has, has nectar is gonna, gonna satisfy. But I, you know, I guess I've, I've, I've tried artificial flowers. I have a, I have a basket of a big ba basket of red flowers hanging on my porch all the time, all winter, um, and I've I've never attracted them to my house, so I wouldn't send the best uh, the best source for that. But but I do think there's you know I think there's going to be some really cool um, native pollinator gardens and things that you're going to start seeing them popping up and. Then, I'm hoping we can get something started at, at the Wildlife Conservation Center along that same vein and, and give people an avenue to look at, at new pollinators um, and what, you know, how, you can, how can you, you can build a native pollinator garden at your own house. Yeah, that would be awesome. I think you would get a lot of people showing up, especially a lot of gardeners too. Um, yeah, that would be great. Um, let me... Does AWCC, the Wildlife Conservation Center, I'm assuming they advertise for the, that was so cute, the Summer Hummer event. Um, if I throw, yeah, they, I'm gonna throw their link in. Yeah, so I just, for those who are interested in the Wildlife Conservation Center, um, I threw a link into the chat as well. Um, so yeah, and they, and we'll, we'll, advertise on the refuge facebook page too um as it gets closer to the event and i just want to throw it out there so that you know if anybody was local or they they already had a trip planned to alaska it's like boy if you're driving by and you miss that you would kill yourself so just wanted to wanted to give people a heads up yeah absolutely thank you um wonderful that concludes all the questions we had tons and tons amazing questions and tons of engagement. So thank you so much for throwing those in. And um, if you have any additional questions, feel free to email Todd or call him there, um, play some phone tag. <laughs> um, but thank you for, for everyone. And th thank you so much, Todd, for being here and for sharing your passion, which is obvious, and your time. And um, Todd was a volunteer tonight, everyone. So um, this is out of the graciousness of his heart. So thank you so much and learned a lot. Who doesn't love hummingbirds? So this was great. Thank you. No, thank you. And and yeah, you know, I there's nothing better than than going to to people's houses and and banning a hummingbird and, and letting them watch it, you know, watch it fly off and just um you know, being able to have some of those conversations about climate change and stuff with them. It's, um, it's special. And, and I just appreciate everybody that, everybody that calls me with their report. So uh, thank you again for inviting me. Yeah, of course. And for those who are interested in the RAD framework um, surrounding climate change, that was mentioned in Todd's presentation. Again, um, AWA will be co-hosting a climate adaptation workshop in February. So the link is in the chat but um, pre-register for that and you can find out more and uh, yeah, tie it all together with what you learned tonight. So thank you and have a good evening, everyone. Thanks again. And our next Wildlife Wednesday will be in two weeks. Uh, we will be posting it out of our Southeast chapter. So looking forward to seeing everyone soon.
Bye, everyone. Okay.